All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Don't Blame the CRM podcast series. As you always know, uh, and as you know, we always focus on revenue operations, and we have exciting guests. This time we have a person from a company called Gong. Many of you might know it. So welcome to the show, Santano. Delighted to be here, Miko. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. First of all, it would be nice if you could briefly introduce yourself and what you do at Gong and maybe even a little bit about your history. You have been part of very exciting companies also in the past. Of course, happy to. So, uh, so I'm Shantanu, Shantanu Shekhar. I'm based in the sunny country of Ireland in, in Dublin. Uh, I have been in the revenue operations world for about a better part of a decade. Um, I started off in the past as a management consultant at Bain, where I spent a lot of time working on um, revenue and growth acceleration, full potential projects, which really got me interested in that side of the world. And about, about five years into consulting life, I realized I wanted to really go in and make a difference at, at my client side. And somehow I made an entry into, into tech and revenue operations in LinkedIn. Back then, revenue operations was not even a word, right? It was yep. used to be sales operations. And then I was at LinkedIn for about close to five years, did a couple of different roles working on the SMB business in Europe first, then the broader Europe, Middle East, Africa business, where we're looking at the broader business operations across the customer life cycle. Yep. Uh, and then I was at a smaller startup uh, for about a year or so, a company called Nitro. And in both those places, I was a customer of this company called Gong. You just mentioned this amazing platform for revenue intelligence and revenue operations people like me. And uh, they had a role. I've been here since January now. I'm very excited to be here. That's exciting. Uh and you have been part of different companies. And, and as you mentioned, revenue operations is quite a new term. It used to be maybe sales ops and strategy. Mm -hmm. But how do you define revenue operations? What does it mean for you and, and Gong? Great, great. So for me, I think in revenue operations, a lot of people define it differently. Like you rightly said, there are different terms. There's so many different roles across the entire customer life cycle or the go-to-market teams as well, right? So if I think about that entire customer life cycle, there's really three core pillars. That, are, that is driven to me by the by the revenue operations teams. And then there's a base and a plinth, if you will. And the three core pillars to me is literally driving go-to-market strategy, right? Right from when a lead comes in to when it becomes a eventually, a, hopefully, a paying customer. How do you mm -hmm. think about that go-to-market strategy in motion? How do you plan both for the longer term and really build that? But even smaller operational questions, like what should the segmentation look like and so on? So that's like the first strategic pillar. And that's where you drive a lot of thought leadership. In RevOps. The center pillar for me is more on the operational aspect of it. So both there's a multitude of processes that you run across the entire go-to-market motion, as well as what are the systems that we use. In fact, the revenue tech stack, both in the, in the marketing world, the sales world, the customer success world, is just massive now. So how do you really think about the systems that are giving you value and how do you optimize for that? And that's where process leadership comes into revenue mm -hmm. operations. And the third aspect for me is more around data and insights. And really it's about, there's a lot of data. In fact, there's, there's so much data now being thrown at us from every direction and every side, but how do you really pull out insights from that data is key. And I think really thinking about what are the metrics that matter? How do you define them? How do you really build that almost dictionary and lexicon across your organization and revenue organization to drive revenue forward? That's the third pillar. And then for me, the base and the plinth, especially as you think about revenue operations, it's all starts and ends with people. So that's what those two are. So at the foundation of it is your actual team that you're working with. And it depends on the on the company side. And I know I know a lot of uh, so company size, not side. A lot of companies have a RevOps team of one when they start up and then eventually start mm -hmm. growing. And you obviously have the bigger companies of the world, which are hundreds of people in RevOps, like in LinkedIn and when I was there. Yep. Um, so that team and managing the team and thinking about that people leadership is, is, is important. Uh, and then to me, the the real plinth on top is really how do you engage with all the stakeholders? Because solving the problem, identifying the issue, how do you move forward is step one, but really the core piece is how do you drive change? And to do that, you have to work with stakeholders, senior go-to-market leaders. How do you really work with that broader team and really the entire revenue organization to move forward? So people are the foundation and then you have go-to-market strategy, you have operations and processes and data and insights. We'll, we'll talk about all of them, but just so that we put things into context, you mentioned people. Uh, how big is Gong as a company in terms of employees and how many people work in the RevOps team at the about moment? It. So Gong is about give or take a thousand people now. So it's, we're not even 
I guess now we're beyond that stage where we call ourselves a startup. And uh, within that, the revenue operations or go-to-market operations team, as we call it, is, is, is more than 50 people. Um, and my role specifically is in the Europe, Middle East, and Africa uh, region. So here, we are a startup within the startup. So we, we only started in July in, in, the, in, in Dublin. And yeah, we're growing July last year, you know, this year, July 2021. So we're really growing here. Yeah. And uh, then obviously, since you're based in, in, in Dublin, focusing on EMEA, uh, I guess there's lots of go-to-markets uh, uh, things going on uh, at the moment. Uh, but who are the key stakeholders? I would imagine VP sales, VP marketing, VP customer success. And also, how do you work with other RevOps teams that are focusing on North America and other, other parts of the world? And, I think, and, that's, and that's very interesting. And you rightly said that the core, if I think about the core stakeholders, obviously start with the regional leaders. But I think when you're, when you're in a regional revenue operations role, and this is becoming quite, um, quite a lot of a feature for most teams which are growing, especially the ones which either start in the US, grow internationally, or start in Europe, like mine, and then potentially you'd obviously have a bigger base outside Europe as well. Um, to me, there are two types of stakeholders. There is your region, you have two teams, right? You have a regional team, but then you're also part of the broader global team. And to me, the striking that balance between what you are almost incubating locally and, and then trying to expand as one piece, and how do you balance that with the global agenda and drive that here? I think it's both, both are equally important. Uh, so on the global side, I think on the stakeholder side, I would say, uh, obviously the go-to-market operations team I just talked about, that would be, I would say, another my, my second team there as well as my first team here uh, and core, core stakeholders. Then I would say thinking about the same go-to-market leaders which are in, let's say, US-based roles or global roles also as important to work with. The other very important team with, to work with, especially on the data and insights part, is, is finance. Mm. And uh, most, most SaaS companies have a strong financial planning anal analysis or fp &A team that you'd work with. So that's another uh, team of stakeholders I would think of. And yeah, that's, I think those would be the core, core piece. You mentioned metrics. Uh, uh, based on the previous episodes, the typical situation is that RevOps team that they don't have their own unique KPIs, but they sort of follow the company objectives and key metrics. Is that also the case for you at Gong and in the previous places? That company objectives, those are the, also the objectives and metrics for the RevOps team. That is right. I would almost think of it, I would say yes, and because yes, I think you're absolutely, I think as in revenue operations, and I think of it being the other side of the coin to the go to market teams, right? Which is, if the go-to-market leader, let's say in my case, the VP of sales or VP of marketing I'm working with here, for them to be successful, they need to focus on, let's say, driving a certain part of the agenda, but everything else, which is from the op making sure the operational piece is taken care of, giving them the insights you mentioned data that they need is, is part of the RevOps role. So therefore, I would say the very high level from a KPI for the team, yes, I would say making whatever is it, making the company successful, the region successful, that's number one, but the second layer we also add in and we do a good job of this is literally thinking about our own teams and what are we driving, right? So for example, if you're driving a lot of operational changes, how are we able to do that in a certain efficient manner? Or if you've been leading a few, and then again, most RevOps teams drive transformations and changes across the organization, how effective has the change been? Like we launched a product earlier this year, we launched our focus product. So in that, how did we drive, were there any, I don't know, the best, uh, the best way I define this in, in operation, especially in RevOps, if there's no noise, that's actually good news. So the, mm -hmm. the least amount of noise, I don't know if that's a metric which you can use, would be another piece. Yeah. But yeah, it's almost driving value and being as efficient and effective as possible. Yeah. How about day to day? Uh, like, what are you doing on a daily basis, on a weekly basis? I guess there's some internal meetings, right. but you also meet with external yes. uh, stakeholders yeah. like customers. How much do you work with? I don't know, technology, data vendors, how much is it about internal planning? And mm -hmm. how, how does a typical day look like, for example, today or tomorrow? Like, what do you have okay. on the agenda? I would say I'm probably, and I, I'm a past consultant, so I love a two by two. So let's say internal, external is one access, uh, one part of the access. The other access I would think of almost is thinking longer term versus short term, because a large part of uh, what makes people in this role uh, successful or not is how do you balance thinking both longer term, say at the 30,000 feet, you have to think about the longer term, the bigger picture, as well as the shorter term, what I might call keeping the lights on. Mm. Uh, so 
if I think about the balance between those four, I would say there's a fairly equal balance because if I think about the typical day in, in my life, and again, this varies depending on the stage at which a company is, the role, the region, and so on. Um, for me, I would say I would spend a fairly large amount of time in internal uh, conversation thinking about um, what's our plan for next year going to be like, how, and, and so on and so forth. Also, because of the product, because specifically in my role, Gong is a product where I have a lot of value to add as being part of the revenue function. So I spend a lot of time in working on the product side with working, talking to product teams and so on. So there's a lot of internal conversations there from a longer term, but shorter term, like literally before our conversation, there was um, an SDR who had come up to me and said, hey, can you please add me to the book of this new AE who has joined? So how do you map that at the same time? So literally mm -hmm. um, building territories as conversations on quotas and et cetera. So there's a lot of, lot of that which comes up as well. But again, the more I can automate and plan for that and organize that, I think mm -hmm. it helps me focus a lot more on that longer term strategy that I talked about. Uh, externally, I would say you mentioned vendors. I think spend a lot of time with talking to uh, folks like you, Miko, as well as there are a few companies. Again, I think in the world we are, where I mentioned this massive tech stack, there are a lot of systems which we look to use for adding efficiency and effectiveness in our own processes and the overall, um, I would say, making the customer life cycle as frictionless as possible within the company. So there's definitely a lot of conversations, both to both to see what's out there and try and understand, which I spent some time on, which is more for our own internal processes. And second, I end up talking a lot to customers of Gong, especially even a lot of customers of Gong are also in revenue operations roles. So I tend to talk, talk to them and spend some time there to just see if they're getting value from the product, what more we can do for them. So you, you, so you meet with some some vendors every now and then and i think revops is sort of a new up and coming very important buying center for many especially for many sales and marketing technology vendors when you when you when you meet with these people and i guess aes from those companies like is there something that they all could do better or most of them could do better just to understand revops as a buying center uh, or what are your thoughts like what would be your tip for those people who sell to RevOps teams? Great. Very interesting question. I think I would think of three things really, because I know um, a lot of a lot of people do sell to RevOps now. With. So number one thing I think for me is, as I just mentioned, there's so much juggling and balancing. Again, most, most people are, but uh, RevOps people love for people to come straight to the point. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that a lot of, a lot of our, Selling methodologies talk about discovery questions and understand the problem. Most RevOps people you talk to will have a sense of the problem that they have, and I think that's number one. They should definitely come straight to the point. I think that will really help. Uh, second, I think this is now more of a feature, not just for RevOps, but in general, the buyer is becoming a lot more informed and educated about the competitive landscape and um, knows what are the different systems out there. But in RevOps, even more so, they would have done maybe a if, if, I'm a, if I'm buying a product, I'd probably have set up like a clear business use case on what I want, what's the ROI I need, mm -hmm. look at different options as option A, B, and C, this is the pros and cons and make that list. Uh, often it'll help to have that conversation up front. That's, that's, that's an important one. Um, and third, I think um, what's in it for me or the acronym WIIFM, uh, I think just talking to how that product that you have, how it will make that RevOps professional's job a little easier, whether it's in any of those pillars we just talked about, or even elevating their own ability to do the job better. No, I think those are excellent tips being straight to the point. And also I've seen it uh, myself that compared to maybe VP sales or VP marketing, because RevOps is doing this for a living and every day. I mean, they're, they are often better informed uh, in terms of technology because it's really their job to build that technology stack so that's that's definitely an important one uh, let's talk about gong because then it's easy to put things into context so gong obviously it's a great company i think especially in the us lots of companies and SaaS companies i feel that almost everyone is using it conversation intelligence provides lots of good insights for salespeople, also for other people like product managers and, and, and so on. And nowadays, I guess in Europe, same thing is, is happening. But are you mainly going after like 
software businesses, because I would imagine those are the early adapters, like other SaaS companies, they want to implement conversation intelligence, they have lots of AEs doing tons of demos, like, how do you define your own ICP for Gong um, uh, these days? Well, great question, and, and I think you're right, I think we've, we've also, we're obviously very, very big in the US where, where we started off. Um, we're only about, Gong right now is only about seven years old as a company. So it's still relatively new in that sense. So you're right, our early adopters definitely have been in the technology world. But more recently, we've had a lot of different companies from the, like when we have, we have customers in healthcare, in manufacturing, in stocking. So our industry definitely, our uh, uh, industry spread is, bring, is, is, is broadening quite a bit. But if I think about, as you'd imagine, given the entire revenue intelligence space and the focus there, it would be, it'll start with, Take in that space in um, general. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then, I mean, we have been discussing with other companies who sell to software businesses that obviously identifying early adapters is one thing because mm -hmm. revenue ops, when it comes to sort of the sales ops part of the rev ops role, that they want to provide the best possible prospects for the mm -hmm. that are those early adapters. Like, is it? When you mentioned data and insights, do you talk about? Do you mean that type of data and insights, like identifying those early adapters out of thousands and, and thousands of companies that these are the ones that we should do business with, and then you sort of give them for both sales and marketing so that they could do uh, right. business with them? I, I would I would make another yes, and I think that's definitely important. Uh, what I don't know if I literally think about the overall data and insights piece. It really depends on who the audience is. And, and what I mean by that is right now, let's say you're selling to a company which has many different roles. And let's say we go into the typical uh, software as a sales, uh, sorry, so, uh, so SaaS company model, and we look at their, their entire piece. You have the C level, you have, let's say, VPs of sales, marketing, go to market leaders. You actually have front line managers and then you have people literally frontline whether it's sales customer success the frontline doers as well at every level i would almost start with a three-step question which is why do they need certain data and insights hmm. yep. what do they need to inform that and how will they get that and an example like for example the let's say the c-suite the ceo and team they care about having a pulse of the business so they can report to shareholders and stakeholders or whoever, whether it's a public company or a private company and think about longer term vision and make, make decisions on how they think about investments for next year and plan and so forth. The, the VPs of sales and marketing and so on, they, they care about not just a very, uh, that same forecasting as well, but they also care about pipeline, being able to actually manage and handle what's happening in data, mm -hmm. short term as well as long term, and, and then being able to again report up there. The frontline managers, they, they care about what their, their, their uh, leaders care about, but they also then care about the performance of their team. Literally every single person, how do they help drive that forward? And then the, finally, the, the, in the front line, let's say, I mean, let's take a sales example. CS and marketing have similar but different, uh, different use cases. Mm. On the sales side, EA cares about how they're performing and what, are the, what, are, what tools do they have to really mm. uh, get better, better views. So when you mention the account information, and I can go deeper mm. into this, and A will care about what are some of the indicators I have in my, uh, whether it's, you want to call it my book of business or the territories that they've been assigned or some accounts that they're hunting into. Those salespeople really care about, do I have the right information? Do I have information whether it's on the company or the contact? And do I have the right information about some of their behavior or usage, which will help me drive mm -hmm. forward? And therefore the insights they need is on that specific performance there. While again, at the CEO level, the performance is very different. Yeah. So if we think about that sort of account level information, obviously many, many companies want to place that information directly into CRM. And uh, then you might have also same type of data available in marketing automation systems. But I've seen also quite a few teams that they're building their own sort of cloud data warehouse they might call it CDP, customer data platform. What are your thoughts? What, what do you think will happen? Do you think people will use CRM as sort of the master data for everything RevOps related? Or do you believe that there will be uh, these data uh, or cloud databases and data lakes where people and RevOps teams will store all the information and then they will feed data from those 
warehouses to CRMs and marketing automation and other other systems. And I think I think you're right. We're at, we're at an inflection point. Nick. And I think to be fair, we can go either way. And uh, especially people like me who have been in the ops world for a long time, we used to call CRM our source of truth, right? And we still I still call it that, right? Uh, but obviously, you have all these different, uh, like I said, data lakes and and so on, which will which will become or is already becoming rather the source of source of truth, the new source of truth, because it's not just the CRM, it's pulling data from the likes of say gain side or the customer success tool is pulling data. From, so it's pulling data from literally your entire go to market tech stack and also talks to, I mentioned finance and that team being an important stakeholder forever. It also helps pulling data from, let's say they're using something like an adaptive insights for planning and so on. So it's becoming that it's slowly that there is that movement for sure. Uh, but I think the there is still going to be a space for both both those data lakes. There's also obviously the CRMs that we talk about, but there's also what I might call a platform which connects everything together, and that's hmm. part of what I'm very excited about. What we are doing is that we're literally trying to build that platform which connects with the CRM, connects uh, with the data sources that you have, as well as making it a lot easier not just hmm. to access the data but also enter the data. I think it will be yeah. Important. Yeah, no, because that's, I, I feel that I, we have seen both examples. So some people, they really believe that it's, I mean, HubSpot or Salesforce or whatever they use as a CRM, that's the source of truth. But then some some people feel that no, it has to be a data lake. And then uh, as a data vendor, you always integrate or you make sure that you can deliver your data into that data lake. So that's why I'm, that's why I'm asking. Uh, I mean, you have been in the RevOps space quite some time and part of big successful companies. Now we have a new generation of individuals also joining and RevOps teams are growing. So lots of people having their first RevOps role. Uh, first question, what do you think is an ideal background or is it even possible to mention an ideal background if you want to join RevOps team and be part of all those three pillars that you mentioned? Like what, what would make a good background for that's true, and it's and, and you're right. It's it's because RevOps is such a, and I'm very excited to be part of this movement, as I call it. I think it's in such a great great phase of growth that it's very difficult to define an exact background. I've, I've seen people who've been successful in RevOps who've come from a very analytical background, who've done in, let's say an engineering degree or something analytical like that, and then coming through a certain analytical job or, or role, like something even like consulting, that's been one, one piece. But I've equally seen people who've been, let's say an SDR in a certain role and they've been very successful as well. So I think to me it's more less than the actual background of what they've done. I think it's also a combination of skills that they're picking up as well as the curiosity that you need to be in the role. And to me, there are really three core parts of it. I think number one, and I call this thought leadership, but literally how do you focus on problem solving? Um, one mm -hmm. very wise person I'd worked with once, he was a VP of marketing. He had said um, for a couple of people, he said, in RevOps, you tend to run towards fires rather than away from fires. I think just, just having that curiosity and joy of solving a problem, I think is key. Uh, second, and I, it goes back to process leadership, thinking very, very, I would say in clear ways. And, and that's something which can be trained mm -hmm. by the way, all of these can be trained, where you're thinking about, Oh, how do you think of a process? How do you draw a blueprint? I, I mentioned customer life cycle twice or thrice at least. How do you build that map of that customer life cycle? What are the processes, systems that work? There was the blueprint there and how do you really optimize that? How do you think of talent life cycle? One more thing, which is very, very important in RevOps. Like I talked about the keeping the lights on. How do you think about when someone joins and someone leaves? So literally think someone who can think about that and really put pen to paper and uh, drive that process end to end. And that obviously connects to how you think about systems as well. Uh, and the third piece to me, and it goes back to what I said, is the base of everything or foundation is just people leadership because most of what we do in RevOps is solving the problem and creating is part one. And it's just like 20% of the job. 80% is how do you drive that change and work with people to really influence the decision that needs to be made. Yeah. Uh, typically towards the end of the year, many people start predict predicting the future. We're actually... Uh, <clears throat> Also, just recently, we posted our predictions for B2B sales and marketing trends. We have actually done it quite a few years in a row. This is the eighth year when we when we did it. I would imagine you you believe that a conversational conversation intelligence is one trend, but what are the other trends when it comes to B2B sales, B2B marketing, go-to-market technology? What do you think, what are the trends now in 2023? So I think, uh... 
And by the way, conversation intelligence, let's say, is already, it could have been a trend, hopefully, two, three years ago in yours. It's now what we call revenue intelligence. That would probably be the next, which is, it's using that reality or information and really think about insights going back to how do you drive revenue. I think that's number one. Uh, to me, second thing, um, and it's very relevant for you because you're in the world of data, as why well, I think, how do you think about, I mentioned earlier about there's so much data and there's, I actually think there's there's only good data or bad data, or sorry, let me rephrase, there's no good data or bad data. There's bad data and worse data today that we see, and that's because there's so much information and so much duplication and so much, so many gaps. So, so I think there's definitely some, some movement there I would expect on content, because we've seen so many different uh, efforts and pieces coming in, and I think you guys are doing a great job of it as well, but how do we continue to move forward on almost that data uh, synchronization and streamlining, I think the second. Uh, third, I think you, we've talked about buyer behaviors changing and those trends changing. If I combine that with, obviously the last two, three years have been a big change and shift in how we work and how we buy. And then obviously just, just as, the, as we were coming out of the pandemic, the macroeconomic situation. So there's so much which has happened there. So I think the big shift in uh, go-to-market sales and marketing, uh, overall sales and marketing coming for me there would be about how do... The, how do the entire buyer process and the buying behavior change? There's a lot more buying committees making decisions now. And like I mentioned, people are a lot more informed about decisions. Mm. So something big, which is probably going to happen. So those are three, I would say. So revenue intelligence, a lot more, a lot more data-oriented, insights-oriented actions. Second, I would say more data literacy or streamlining coming forward in terms of this clarity of chain data. And third, just buyer behavior is changing to more informed committee buying decisions. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, two last questions. Um, the first one, if you want to develop yourself and learn more about RevOps, like what are the places you go to? Do you have like specific LinkedIn groups or communities or like go to places online? Like how do you make sure that you're always in, uh, learning and, and learning new things and understanding RevOps even more? Yeah, in exactly. And, and I think again, two, three years ago, there was really nowhere that you could go to it would all be depending on if you knew someone or your company has a team. I think a couple of places now, slowly, which are coming up, there's a lot of these Slack groups which have come up and initially they started off as being overall across go-to-market functions, but now there are a couple of them which are specifically dedicated to revenue operations. Um, RevOps Co-op is one, the other is Wizards of Ops, and both are actually US-based, to be honest, which is a little tougher for us in Europe to be part of the physical meetups, but there's a lot of conversations and pieces there, which are great. Uh, and second to me, again, I think there's a lot of literature out there now, again, on, um, and there are people who are doing a great job. There are a few influencers and people who have been quite, quite public and just taking the RevOps movement forward. And they've been, they've been quite, um, I would say, vocal on LinkedIn as a platform. There's, there's so many articles and pieces that come out. So I think we combine those two and third, uh, I think a lot of events, um, and especially companies like Wine, and that's literally what you're doing with this podcast and a few others. I think there's a lot more events and speaker series and so on coming, which people can attend as well to start learning. But again, there's it's to me, it, it all goes back to the initial curiosity of problem solving, and people can literally start from there. Excellent. And then the final question um, Do you have somebody in mind who would be an awesome next? guest in the in the show like someone that you look up to someone you work quite a bit or someone who has been uh, just uh, teaching you lots of things or you feel it would right. add lots of good value for the audience yeah i think and i think uh, this would be so he's the vp of sales operations or revenue operations at a company called rubric in the us uh, his name is dhruv nag he was actually my mentor when i was at linkedin oh, uh, someone who's very very knowledgeable especially in, in your world about data data as well as the entire interplay of, of revenue operations, both long term, short term, would be a good one to talk about. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for the tip. And also, big thanks for the for the conversation. Lots of valuable insights. So, big thanks for being part of the part of the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, Miko, and thank you for taking forward the RevOps movement. Appreciate it.